Okay, well, I, I'd like to kick this off if everyone's okay with getting started. I suspect we'll have a few more people joining in, but um, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Beth Gordon uh, from Pace University and sitting here with Meg Burke, who is um, one of our eterns who just became full-time. Um, some of you uh, may have worked with Sam Egan, and sadly she left us to uh, start a new life chapter in Kansas, but um, we, we all miss her, but we're, we're very happy to have Meg uh, kind of working with us and uh, filling that position for us now. So um, it's great. Um, I recognize some of the names, but if, if participants don't mind typing in where you're from in the chat, that helps us keep a record of where everyone's from, and especially if you happen to be sitting with a colleague, just note that as well so we know who's attending. And thanks so much for Keith, uh, to Keith from um, CUNY Purchase for hosting us in Adobe and helping us with all the tech issues here. Keith had the good suggestion to mute the mic when you're not speaking, but um, certainly uh, we can share the microphone and give uh, anyone, who, anyone, anyone who wants to speak the, the opportunity. So uh, our, I see you're posting your introductions, which is great. Thank you. And um, our agenda has Christina up first with um, Mahara 1.10 updates. Christina, are you ready to go? Yes, I am ready to go. Great. OK, we'll turn it over to you then. Thanks. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Um, no, my um, webcam doesn't want to work this morning. So welcome also from my end, um, the, the New Zealand end of the world, to uh, our first um, fall MAC meeting or spring MAC meeting. And thank, thank you very much to um, Beth, her team, and also Keith for organizing it and making it possible for everyone to join in. Um, I'd just like to take a few minutes' time, because we have a full agenda today, to just point out some highlights of Mahara 1.10, which we released just a couple of weeks ago. And um, there are altogether quite a lot of new features that we have developed, um, 36. And some of them are very small, but others are quite large and involved. Uh, we also fixed 240 bugs. And now we also have a song, which most of you probably have already heard. Um, and what I'd just like to do is go through six of those features that um, I think stand out uh, quite, quite heavily because they um, have a lot of new things that community members wanted to have for a long time or things that came up very recently. And what you see here directly is um, the messages to multiple people. That was development work out of Germany um, from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And that now allows you to send notifications, messages to more than one person, and also to reply to more than one person. Um, Tobias also implemented that you can now see all the messages that you sent through the system, which was not really easy to see in the past because you never really knew what you had sent to others and that they replied back and then you replied again. And so now <coughs> this has been made really easy to do and um, enhances the experience of actually also knowing what you've received, what you have sent, and also being able to send um, yeah, notifications and kind of almost emails to more than one person and therefore reach uh, multiple people at once. Another very new feature is uh, that you can drag and drop pages into collections. Um, this was relatively small work, um, but does enhance the usability. You can still also click the checkboxes in order to put pages into your collection, but you can also use the all familiar drag and drop that we have during the page editing process. Therefore, making it easier to position these pages within your collection to reorder them, and also um, with the 
little um, links at the top. We just pointed out here. Um, the all and none links, you can also directly put all your pages into a collection and therefore um, be done more quickly. Yes, Keith, and reordering of those pages within the collection via drag and drop as well. That is correct. A third nice feature is um, that we have a simple text box again. Um, several versions ago, we converted uh, regular text boxes to notes so that you could reuse them in your portfolios. Um, now you can also attach files to it. Um, you can attach a license. You can have tags. And you can have feedback on them. And that was a feature request that at the time was wanted by a number of users in the community because it was not possible then to repurpose a text box they had written. And a number of people had um, used these text blocks um, to also write quite a bit of text that they wanted to repurpose in other pages. However, over time it has been shown that this implementation was not really ideal because people still wanted to have simple text boxes um, that are not kept in their notes section. And therefore, um, this was implemented. And uh, what you have now in Mahara 1.10 is that you can have a very simple text that just looks like this here on the screen. You just have a title and a um, and your editor window, but you don't have any other features. You can save that and therefore use that in order to just have short descriptions for other blocks or um, just point something out that you want to display on this particular page. But you cannot reuse that um, on another page unless, of course, you copy and paste the content in. We've also kept the more elaborate notes because they do have their purpose, especially, for example, when you set up a bunch of template pages and want to repurpose instructions or any other things multiple times. And maybe also when, when you want to link um, or create the same text and then have that available in multiple pages. So both are currently there. Um, outside, in the content chooser, the standard simple text block is the more prominent one. Um, but under, but you'll also find the notes one very easily. And because we have received feedback that a lot of people kind of just got confused by the many notes they have um, in their portfolio because everything was kept, there is also a converter in the administrative interface where you can convert all your current notes into simple text blocks. That means any note that is not being used in another page, that does not have license information attached to it, or feedback, or any other things, will be converted into a simple text block. And therefore, um, the note section will also be, be shorter in the future. What we've also heard a lot of times uh, from the community is that it is not possible to adjust the dashboard page, the profile page, and also to a certain degree the group home page. Um, meaning that um, an administrator or a site administrator or no, um, a server administrator always needed to make that change or a site administrator needed to log in. Uh, with a specific login in order to make changes to the dashboard template and also to the profile page. This can now be done on the site administrator interface. Um, and there you can create your own dashboard and your own profile so that you can take out any of the blocks that are currently there that you don't want to have there and uh, put others on there that you prefer to have there. One caveat, though, is that it does not work for existing pages because um, users could already have made changes to their dashboard profile uh, page and also to group home pages. So it only works for new users and also for new groups that are being set up. However, that is still a very good functionality, especially when you start out using Mahara, that you set up your system um, directly how you want it to be. 
And, um, and one of the very big features that we have in Mahara 1.10 is archiving of portfolio submissions. That is development work uh, funded by the University of Canberra. And it allows you to um, archive portfolios that have been submitted to a group on this server and also retrieve those files um, easily. The archiving needs to be turned on in the group settings and it is only available like the submissions in general for staff and administrators. Um, but it allows you to make the submissions available afterwards so that if you use Mahara for assessment purposes, you can keep a copy of what the student submitted at a time. We do not distinguish whether it's a draft or a final submissions or things like that, but anything that has been submitted in a group that has um, archiving turned on will be um, saved on the server and can then be archived off-site, say at the end of a term or at the end of an academic year. You can also export all the data that you see in the table um, in CSV format meaning that you also get the path to the files where the individual portfolios are located. This new functionality also brings with itself an export queue um, because when 10, 20 or 30 portfolios or more are archived at the same time, this might um, eat quite a bit of server resources. And so all the archiving will be placed in a queue and then the release of the portfolios is only made once uh, the server has finished uh, the queue and has gone through it. If there are any problems with the export, there will be a notification in, and you can restart the export again. And the export queue also works for Leap2A portfolios that users um, export themselves if that functionality is turned on in the site administrator settings. And these two features are currently still experimental um, because they require quite a bit of testing, especially load testing, and seeing how everything works out in reality and when there are um, submissions made and releases made. So we are especially interested in hearing from you, uh, hearing from you and getting your feedback on that functionality in case there are things that still need to be tweaked for this experimental feature. Um, Lori, uh, it creates, yes, it does create a copy of the student page in the sense of the portfolio that the student submitted um, for assessment purposes or for feedback into a group that will be placed on the server and um, therefore you, the, you could also give it back to the students at a later stage for importing if they wanted to get back to an earlier stage. This is um, part of a feature for Canberra that we are working on. The second part could not yet be finished, which would be to integrate it with the Mahara Assignment Submission plugin, so that also portfolios submitted to Moodle can be um, archived and uh, archived during the release process. Um, and now, uh, last but not least, um, one feature that a lot of people were waiting for is um, to have more modern social media accounts available in the profile instead of MSN account, um, AIM account, IRC, and ICQ, and so on. So this feature was developed by Gregor. And now you can add any social network to your Mahara account and um, have links available in a blog where you can, where people can then just simply go to your profile. So what's coming up next for the next half year? Well, we've already started working on new features for the next release. And one big change that you will be hearing from us is um, that we went over to a different really, uh, versioning system for Mahara to indicate the releases. Um, currently, we are on one where it's, um, that doesn't really follow any particular rule very strictly. And so we are moving to a date-based release uh, numbering system, which means in our case that uh, the next release will be 1504, 
meaning that it was released in the year 2015 and in the month of April. Um, with that, we hope that it will be easier for users to, and, and also institutions and site administrators to know when their um, Mahara version was released, how long it will be um, supported, because um, calculating one and a half years is quite easy in this case, because it means um, the 15.04 version is supported until 16.10, so um, until October 2016. And since our current versioning system doesn't really show you any way whether there's that's a big release or a small release, um, we thought it might be better to have a database system. So that's what we are moving to. And um, so we are, we are not making a huge jump in terms of functionality if you think kind of going from version 1 to version 15, but it is a different versioning system. Um, yes, Roger, we will have minor points as well for security, and those will be 15 or 4.1. Uh, and so that system is still being retained so that you can see easily um, what are security patches. And that's pretty much all from me. If you have any other questions, uh, please let me know on Twitter or via email or in the Mahara forums. And I look forward to hearing from you what you think about the features that were implemented for 1.10 and what um, your plans also are for using those or how you're using them, implementing them, working with them with your students. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. That was really very interesting. We appreciate your time pulling all that together, and the new features look great. Um, I'd like to turn the uh, microphone over to Roger um, to talk about um, assessment a little bit. As At some of the previous uh, MUG meetings, I see we have some new folks here today, which is terrific. Um, uh, just so that you all know, we've, we've had some themes bubble up, and um, two of the themes that people seem very interested in are assessment and templates. And they kind of go hand in hand. So we have asked Roger and others to kind of share um, how their institutions are grappling with both assessment and templates, or either or, uh, through Mahara. And hopefully this will generate some good discussion among our group. So with that, I will turn it over to Roger. Right. Hi. Can you all hear me OK? Hello? Yes, everybody, good. Right, hopefully you can see um, a PDF as well that I've shared on screen. Um, yep, you've all got it, good. Okay, so the Mahara um, assessment, built-in assessment, where students have to submit the um, page and then it's locked, um, and then the tutor marks it or reviews it or whatever and then unlocks it and sends it back to the student, has been a real problem for us in in the past because nothing wrong with the technology but the human beings. Um, people forget to unlock students' portfolios. Um, if it's a draft submission, students may send in uh, a copy of their page, but um, sorry, uh, send in their page before they've made a copy of it so they can't continue working. It's all sorts of odd, odd issues like that. Um, we've also got to work within our regulations, our assessment regulations, um, which also um, causes a few issues. So what we've come up with is a different um, approach to uh, working with assessment. So what we do is get the students, this is a, the, what I'm sharing on screen, is just a sort of a how-to guide um, at the moment, so it should give you an idea. Um, what we ask the students to do is first create a secret URL of a portfolio they're working on. Um, so once they've generated the secret URL, there it is. They can then copy it. Um, what we then ask them to do is go over and export their either their page or the collection um, as an HTML file, standard HTML website. From there, we then send the students off to upload that zipped up file into our Moodle VLE, which is uh, 0.5 on the screen there. Um, and what that does is means that we've got a locked down copy, like a snapshot of their work at a point in time um, that the exam board will, will accept and the externalists will accept. And the good thing with that is the student can carry on working on their portfolio afterwards, keep it, do what they want with it. Um, the examiners 
to get a locked in time um, version that they know the students can no longer play with. And as far as our regulations go, it's like uploading a Word document or, or any other file. It is simply a file. Um, so it takes it away from being a portfolio in, in that sense. Now, obviously, an HTML file doesn't necessarily have all the bells and whistles and the videos and, you know, links in and live blogs and all sorts of stuff. But it gives you the general impression of where the student is at that point in time. What we also do is ask the student to um, share. So our um, Moodle VLE, when students upload a file, there's an option to give them a text box as well. So in the text box, they paste the secret URL. So what the member staff can then do is see the live all singing or dancing page or collection or whatever it is, but also have a date stamped version as well, which is completely separate and and can be backed up separately and, and archived separately, completely away from Mahara. Um, so once the student's done that, pasted in their um, URL of their secret URL and uploaded their assignment, that's it, job done. The uh, assignment is uploaded and the student gets to keep their um, work going on, on their portfolio. And it's, it's particularly useful where students are having to do formative submission points where, you know, it's a work in progress or whatever. Um, it's also quite useful for um, uh, external examiners to be confident that that is the only version that they're seeing. Um, question from Keith there, how easy was it to get students and faculty to use this workflow? Well, we've got, a, we've got another uh, document for staff of how to set up their assignments, and it is, we've made it as simple as possible, sort of step one, two, three, four, tick these boxes and off you go. And this um, workflow is for students, so seven steps there. What we do is work with the teaching staff to um, make sure all students have a go first. So they've had a practice, they've had a, a practice run, they've handed in a formative one. Um, the other problem we had in the past, which we're going to now review, because the plugins from Moodle to Mahara have gotten an awful lot better. Um, we had problems back with Moodle 1.8 or 9 or whenever it was quite a long time ago, and with uh, Mahara version you name it, 1.3, 1.4, quite a long time ago, um, where we used the um, where we used the uh, assessment plugin tool that was available for Moodle, and we ended up in a right problem once when we had an upgrade of Moodle but not Mahara, and the compatibility went, and we had lots of locked um, portfolios. So there's all sorts of issues that uh, that was our, of our own making in a lot of ways because the system did work beautifully for a while, and then our upgrades went out of sync, and the plugin stopped working, and um, we ended up with all sorts of problems, but they've been redeveloped. That was a few years ago, so they've been redeveloped, and um, that that means we've got uh, sort of an opportunity to review what we do and review if we go back to a, a Moodle Mahara plugin, sort of Mahoodle sort of plugin methodology of submitting assessments. But I think the main problem we had was students would send in an assessment, it would be locked, and then they were stuck and they couldn't do any more work on it, and that's really quite annoying for students, and it's a really silly thing, but we have had days when somebody, you know, a member of staff may have gone sick or left or done whatever, and somebody in admin sat there basically unlocking hundreds of hundreds of portfolios, which isn't very uh, very good. So, uh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll sort of pause there, and I realise time's going on and there's more to do, so any questions, you can type them. All of these documents are available on our help site, so I will um, just stop sharing that so I can give everything back to everyone and type our help site address um, in the chat window and uh, let the next person have a go. Thanks, Roger. You've got us all thinking here. We're, uh, we're eager to see if we could do something similar. We definitely have similar needs to be able to sort of lock, zip, and <laughs> assess. So we appreciate that. Um, I think what we're going to do in the interest of time is uh, pass over our PACE update and uh, ask Keith colleagues to um, do their part if, if they're, if Keith, if they're ready to go. Um, because we, we did want to hear an update from SUNY Purchase and the great work you're doing. So, hi, this is Karen. Hi, this is Karen. Am I on? Yeah, we're going to yeah. get some feedback, though. Okay. So, I'm not actually totally sure 
sure what would be most useful to you guys. I'm going to talk a little bit about some work that Linda Bastone, who's sitting next to me, and I have been doing over the past few years. But if it's not relevant or you want us to go in another direction, just type in, please go this way, and we'll switch course. Um, basically, we've been interested in using portfolios uh, within the context of a summer research program for community college students. So this is a picture from two summers ago. Um, there's actually two programs that are folded into one that have, between the two of them, um, have had about 40 students a summer. So half the students are doing science research for about 40 hours a week. The other half are doing an interdisciplinary course on identity for half of each day and then doing an individual research course project for the other half. Um, they're all community college students. They come from either underrepresented minority groups low income groups or and or first generation. Um, and the objective of both programs is degree completion. We first began using portfolios um, in an effort to document applied learning. So we were working with the Lumina Foundation to um, try and find a way to document the degree qualification profile applied learning outcome. Um, and so that's why we started using the portfolios. Um, because we built reflection in right from the beginning and because our long-term work with the program has led us to focus on identity shift as a mechanism of increasing persistence, that was something that sort of naturally was built into the student's portfolio work from the beginning. Um, but our primary goals, besides supporting reflection, were to try and capture the progress they were making during the summer in a way that potentially could be used for assessment within the program and potentially long-term credit evaluation. Um, because schools have become increasingly interested in whether a student can do something like an intensive research experience and then bring that back and convert it into credit. Um, we presented the portfolios to the students as an academic Facebook exercise, talking to them a lot about um, the value of creating a different identity and that you know over the course of the summer they would be building this academic identity and that their e-portfolio would be a place to showcase that new emerging identity. Um, here are just some of the pages students created. The students had a one to two hour workshop each week. Um, this was a science student and I don't know how much you can see of this, um, but there's you know, a social picture of the student. She has some of her research abstract. She's reflecting on her week in the pro first, second week in the program. Um, and then she starts off just by describing herself. This is one of the identity course uh, portfolio pages. And obviously, these are just snapshots. Um, but it just gives you a feel for the kind of things students were doing. Um, this one we loved because this was a student who was doing a lab science project. She couldn't put her lab notebook in. She took all of her notes on her research by hand in that black um, you know, notebook. So she took a picture of it and put it in. And this is another identity course student. So the assessment that we have done is we had faculty assess students' learning, um, both based on their personal interactions with the student and based on the portfolio alone in 2012. When we just compared portfolios to you know, first-hand knowledge of the students plus portfolios, not surprisingly, the e-portfolios didn't really add a lot and were insufficient to assess some of the learning outcomes um, that the DQP included. Now we've asked naive faculty to evaluate just the portfolios. Um, and we're comparing the naive faculty evaluations to the faculty who actually knew the student. And we'll be presenting that work actually at the AAC and U ePortfolio session in January. But sort of the preview is, although you can't assess all areas of learning, um, all areas of applied learning, there definitely are parts of the applied learning um, outcomes that can be documented and can appear to be, um, even somebody who doesn't know the student can do that on the basis of the portfolio alone. Um, the other thing that we were interested in, and this is sort of more a little further out there. Oh, sorry. What do I mean by naive? So what we just completed was we had previously asked a faculty member who had worked with the students for five weeks 
to evaluate the student based on their ePortfolio and their personal knowledge, and then based just on their personal knowledge. We found from that that those experienced evaluators were better able to evaluate the student based on their personal knowledge and that the ePortfolio didn't add. So last summer we asked naive, meaning people who did not know the student and had not worked with the student, evaluators to go and look at the portfolios alone. And then we compared their evaluations using the same rubrics to the evaluations of the person's mentor. And we found that um, on many of the outcomes, the naive evaluator appeared able to determine whether the work was credit worthy um, without knowing the student. Does that answer your question? OK, good. Um, so the other thing we've been doing, and we presented this um, last year at the ePortfolio session, is looking at identity development across students' ePortfolios. Um, and so, you know, this slide just shows the methods, but we're interested in these three things, um, which we've been interested in for a while. So the first um, just a quick yeah. Hi, Keith. I don't know if, if anyone's able to hear, but we're we're having trouble hearing at this point. I think right now nobody is uh, is saying anything because we are just waiting for for Keith and uh, his colleagues to come back on. So that's why there was uh, silence. It's good, Tina. Thanks for helping to uh, be our tech detective. We'll wait for them. While we're waiting, thanks so much to all of you for your good conversations in the chat area. Um, Roger, I liked your idea about copying the page or collection for assessment. Um, that might be something we could do in the short term while we're waiting for <laughs> upgrades and <laughs> other integrations to help us cobble together a relationship between uh, Mahara and Blackboard. But your suggestion is a good one. And it's just great to have these kind of suggestions with a group like this. Helps to uh, it helps us to evolve our program and you know gather the expertise in the room, so to speak. So we really it's just great to have all the idea sharing here. Yeah. Keith, if uh, if your area is having trouble, we could move on if that would be helpful, or we can we can wait. Let us know what's best for you. OK, it looks like Keith might uh, suggest that we come back to them. Um, it's really fascinating, uh, <laughs> a fascinating update from SUNY Purchase. It sounds like your team is doing great work. Um, we really appreciate what you shared so far. So we welcome, <laughs> we welcome your jumping back in. We're, we were taking notes furiously. I really liked some of your work on identity development. And certainly, we've also tried to present ePortfolio like an academic Facebook. Um, 
And so it's just great to, again, hear, hear some of the strategies and approaches you're using uh, so close by, really, right down the road from us. Okay, so Keith, do you want, if you want, we can um, give our update. We were going to share a couple of templates I believe you have those to make available. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, we um, wanted some of the focus today to be on assessment and templates. And we've done a lot of template work at PACE. I hope you can all hear me, by the way. Can everyone hear? Great. OK, thanks, yeah. Allie. Yes. Yeah. OK, great. Um, and one of our new initiatives that just started this fall is called the PACE Path. And it's, we're really excited because it's an initiative for all our incoming first year students. So what this means for us, um, it's been a hurdle we've been unable to, <laughs> to pass up until this year. We now have all first-year students expected to use ePortfolio. And they are expected to use, in particular, this, this template um, that we've built into Mahara. And um, it's, it's been challenging because, of course, for us, this isn't like a full, fully evolved, uh, dynamic, multimedia ePortfolio, more like a checklist. But it's still a gateway into ePortfolios for us. And it's a way that we're working with our UNV 101 faculty and their peer leaders to get students to upload evidence in each of these areas, showing that students can manage themselves and interpersonal relations and have awareness about organizations and communities, et cetera. And it's a four-year plan, but this particular page um, is designed for the first year. And it's supposed to help our students uh, make the transition to PACE, and also get connected with strong advisement um, because we're really trying to um, improve our retention overall and help our students um, really transition to PACE and, and succeed. So this is one of the ways that we're doing it. We're thrilled that ePortfolio has a, a strong anchor now in our first year initiative, and we wanted to share it with this group um, in talking about templates um, because you know, I think some of you have also done some work with templates, perhaps for career work or assessment work, accreditation, et cetera. And we thought it might be interesting to share um, this first year template with all of you. We also have another template. I see that keeps asking questions. Um, yeah, this, this, template, um, this template is designed to cover the first year. And the four year plan that's under organizational awareness well, yeah, but some items will be the second semester as well. But the four-year plan is preliminary. It will, it will, it's expected that it will evolve. But the idea is to get students to be thinking um, more longer term, even as they begin. And although that these, these items will evolve and change, the idea is to get them thinking in each of these categories um, during their first semester. Um, I'm now, we could switch, um, go to the next slide, Keith, if you don't mind. And uh, Linda, my colleague Linda, is here, and she's going to talk about another template that we have been working with. And the next template is for uh, all writing classes. It's the English. Oh, maybe, we, maybe we can do it. Here there it is. is. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, I guess with both these templates, I, the caveat is that um, we, we meaning the ePortfolio team, didn't really um, have much input into the design of the template. But we certainly are supporting every effort of uh, having students use ePortfolio. And this would be all students in our writing program, which covers uh, two freshman writing courses. English 110 and English 120, and then the upper level writing in the disciplines course, English 201. So it's a way that students can upload um, their work as they are as they are doing it in some ways, in some in some uh, instances for formative assessment, as Roger was talking about before, and also um, for end of semester assessment purposes, where we uh, 
have reviewers who go in and, and randomly sample a number of student ePortfolio documents um, and use a checklist and, and see how students are doing in terms of their writing, writing skills and hopefully making progress. Um, and then at the end of English 201, even transfer students um, can upload papers. Keith, you ask about uh, 201. Ideally, yes, but it doesn't really necessarily work that way. Um, we do target certain sections of English 201 for psych majors, business majors, um, but we haven't been successful in doing that. So it's more generic. Uh, it depends on the individual professor in terms of how um, of how he or she actually designs the course. But the the focus is on uh, research that students do according to their disciplines, majors, and, you know, interests. And uh, so we just started, this uh, last semester was the first time that this was used as a pilot. And of course, it's going to take a while to get all faculty up to speed and students up to speed. The sample was a little smaller than we would have liked to get really good data last semester because there was a problem. There's still a problem we have with permissions that students are still not sharing their work. Um, and uh, now, hopefully, you know, this is going to get easier. And also just getting, getting faculty up to speed and again, getting the buy-in from all the adjuncts that teach these courses. But we're very excited about, first of all, the fact that all, all so this again will be all students, really, um, first year. Not only will they be using ePortfolio in the University 101 class, but they will also be using ePortfolio in their writing classes. Great. Um, thanks. And thanks for all the comments and questions in the chat. It's terrific. Um, we want to, because we're coming short on time, I'd like to turn it back over to our city purchase friends so they could, um, yeah, thanks, Keith. Uh, I want to give them the chance to get back. Can you hear me now? Can you hear us now? Woohoo! Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm just gonna. Okay. Oh. We're right there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I, it, did I go out before you heard about this slide? Okay. So, um, we looked at 61 students from two years who had done at least three journal entries across the five weeks of our summer program. And we were looking for three types of identity development in those students and to see whether they changed over time. Um, the first two were something we'd looked at previously. Um, we've been doing this program for over 10 years now. And so that was this idea of a developing sense of oneself as an academic. So references to scholarly thoughts or accomplishments, like I, you know, I did a great job in the lab today, or I really think our research is important, things like that. Um, the second group was future orientation, and this could be future academic or non-academic orientation. So statements like I'm going to make a difference in the world, um, I'm going to be a biologist, you know, anything like that. And then the third were the most interesting because they actually emerged from the ePortfolios. We hadn't really seen them previously. And this was references to relationships in the context of learning. Um, so this was stuff like, my lab group is doing really important work. Or me and my classmates um, have developed a, a, a place where we can all share our ideas and um, you know, build our understanding together. Um, we looked at every clause within the journal entries for this coding, and clauses could be coded as belonging to multiple categories. So for example, I'm going to do better in school next year is both a future orientation reference and an academic identity reference. 
Um, and what you can see here very quickly is there were significant improvements um, between week one and week five. So dark blue is week one or their initial journal entry, and light blue is their final journal entry, um, which generally came from week five. And so over the course of a five-week intensive program, students in their portfolios shot, showed increasing references to academic identity, future orientation, and scholarly community. Um, and then above each pair of columns, I've reported the correlation in scores between the first and final journal entry. And what you can see is students who had a strong academic identity coming into the program continued to have a strong academic um, identity. So there was a strong correlation there between initial and final scores. Whereas the other two, um, it appears more that they actually were developing over the course of the program and one's initial score did not influence one's final score. Um, so, you know, in terms of the relevance of this stuff to the broader community, Linda and I are really interested in looking at the reflective elements of portfolios to see whether there's evidence of um, identity shift that could be related to increased persistence. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's sort of our next step is looking to see whether students who develop stronger future orientation in particular but also academic identity and sense of scholarly community are more likely to persist when they um, hit challenging courses. So, you know, this is just a summary. We think that the portfolios are useful um, in terms of documenting applied learning, and we'll be um, presenting more information on that in January. Um, we think that they are definitely useful as a means of documenting changes over time, so looking for shifts in identity as well as academic quality of work. Um, and we think the reflective aspect of portfolios may be something that is really ripe for sort of assessment in and of itself. Um, so as I already mentioned, we're planning on following the students longitudinally to see whether they go back to their summary portfolios and to see what happens to students, individual students, um, in terms of persistence and maintaining a sense of scholarly identity. Uh, we have a few other little projects going on right now. Next semester, I'm reworking my introductory level child development course to make it without any tests, but purely based on um, an e-portfolio in which the students will be reflecting on and applying child development findings to their own development or the development of a child that they're interested in. Um, and the, in answer to a question, it is published in a paper, uh, and the link is the very next slide. And the work that we're presenting at the ePortfolio forum, we will be submitting um, to the International Journal of ePortfolio. So we're hopeful that that will be published in a paper also. Um, so there's the child development course. This semester, Linda and I are running a um, social action learning community for transfer students. And in that, we are having the students do reflective writings on a weekly basis, which they are putting together into a portfolio. And so we'll be very curious to see whether we see similar changes. The population in this learning community is quite similar to the population in our um, intensive summer programs. And so we're curious to see whether we'll see similar changes in identity in those students. Did I forget anything? Um, and then this, these are the links. Um, the bottom link is the International Journal of ePortfolios. And the top link is an, a briefer article in diversity and democracy that's on the identity shift work. So sorry about the interruption, and uh, thanks. Oh, lunch too much. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great work. Uh, thank you so much, Karen and Linda. That's really terrific. And I look forward to reading, uh, reading those articles as well to learn more. I really appreciate it. We are short on time, but I believe we do have enough time to hear from Roger again, if you're ready, Roger, to um, share uh, your new theme and embedded help modules. I know that's something we could all we could all use some more help modules. So I'll turn it over to you.
Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Um, right, uh, what I was going to talk about, I've lost track now because I was looking, starting looking at that paper. Um, let me just get this off, I've got this in a PowerPoint actually. Um, what we've done is done some work on um, both the language and the help files and I talked to Christina at some point else so she was saying oh you can do stuff with local files how do you do that we've also come to some fruition with our um, idea of what how C which you can see is the help icon next to the CV builder there so first up how do we change the language um, slightly techy but I'll zoom through this and I can explain in detail to people that need to know more basically in your Mahara uh, on your server there's a directory called local in there you can put files which overwrite the system file the advantage of this is you don't need to change any core code at all you simply put files in your local so what happens the system loads its normal help files or language files and then it overwrites those with your specific code um, for the UK we use the word CV instead of resume so that's the language there um, if I go to the next page, uh, where do you find the files? They've got some really strange file formats and namings and so on. If you look in the uh, URL, you will see artifact resume index. Well, that's what you need to have there, artifact resume uh, PHP. So that's the language file and how to change it. As I said, I can do detail for anyone who wants to know more. Um, next was the help files. So as you can see, we've changed the icon. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and our help file brings up this nice little sort of what, how, see, which was our concept based on some of the stuff Beth had done in earlier conversations in this group. So we came up with this concept of what do I do on this page, how do I do it, and let me see an example. So this is simply the profile one. Um, and we followed that theme all the way through. So how do we do that? Again, it's in the local directory and down a few bits and bods and you end up writing your own local help files which overwrite the system ones. Again, because it's a local directory, every time you do an upgrade, you simply replace the local directory files and that's it. You don't have to touch core code. So um, it doesn't make the developers sweat too much and you can see here the code we've put in. Um, again, where do you put it? Artifact internal index.php and you can see the, that's the file name you have to create and write. Um, finally, how did we change that icon? Because if you look at the bottom icon circled in red, you can see that the, um, the icon, I will answer questions, I've got full screen at the moment, so there's some chat questions I need to answer. Um, the icon down there is that small i icon, which is the same as what was at the top. That again is done in the theme and just very quickly and hopefully not too techy, the top purple line there says display none and that just basically hides the existing icon um, from view, doesn't delete it, just hides it from view and then we replace it with our own icon and that's all we've done um, and that's done in our theme. So those few lines of code, the rest of it just tidies up position and size and so on and so forth. Um, so that's basically that, let me just get out of it this one second and zoom over to um, it in action. So there's our, this was a code change by the way, the home page we have adjusted slightly and made it look a bit more pretty. Um, so we had to change one thing in the uh, index. But now you see it reading hopefully, um, so you can say what is my portfolio, um, how do I do assessment with C, and if I go into any of these areas now, so for instance content, um, and roll over that. It's a slightly slow loading, I'm afraid. I'm on a bit of a rubbish uh, connection. We should end up with the icons <laughs> loading that you saw earlier. I'm afraid they're not loading. I think it's because I've got on to connect. Um, so let me just um, go back into here and see if there's any questions. I'll stop sharing so I know other people want to line up their stuff. Um, so other people can line up and I can answer questions in the chat room. Um, there, and I'll share that uh, PowerPoint with you in a minute. I had problems uploading. I'll just upgrade it to Windows 8.1 and it's all broken. So I'll, I'll do that in a minute. Um, yeah, so uh, any any other questions, please shout in the chat room and I'll let the next person, next person talk unless you want to look at more after the meeting's over. Thanks so much, Roger. You are, I think you're our last speaker for today and we're right about on uh, ending on time, but um, I think this was this was a great meeting, a really a nice mix of uh, templates, assessment, uh -huh. research, so a little bit of tech talk at the end there, Roger, <laughs> keeping us on our toes. Um, 
And uh, we have such a great turnout today from people all over. It's just uh, it's really nice. Um, I really enjoy hearing from everybody, and I hope all of you did too. We have just a couple of minutes, so if folks want to hang out and pose questions in the chat, feel free. Uh, thanks again to Keith for uh, hosting through Adobe, and then he, he makes the video available that we can share through Facebook and the Mahara Wiki. Uh, and Christina has given us a few gentle prompts to um, share some of our templates and workflows uh, through the Mahara Wiki as well. So I'd like us all to try to do that because um, some of the absorbing this information takes a little longer than we can do in this one hour, but hopefully um, this kind of meeting Stir some ideas in each of us, and we can continue to collaborate um, after this meeting, uh, you know, individually and collectively. Um, <laughs> and Linda's prompting me to ask when the next meeting will be. Um, we do. We've been trying to meet quarterly, about you know, about four times a year, and um, I feel like that that works. If there's interest in meeting more, let me know. Um, we're an informal group, but if I don't hear from it, anyone, um, then I guess we would look to schedule perhaps in January. Yeah. And um, pretty soon it will be time to start thinking about ABLE again for next year. And I wonder if um, people in this group might want to start thinking about doing another type of presentation together. We had such a good run of it last year and even had Roger and Sam join remotely. So if any of you have some ideas, the call isn't out yet, but um, it might be good to start start thinking that over. Okay, I'm hearing late January might be good for our next meeting. Okay, so we'll look to schedule uh, our next meeting in late January, but do hope to stay in touch through Facebook and the Mahara Wiki and other ways uh, as we can. It's a really great group. Any last comments from anyone? Feel free to take the mic if you would like to uh, say anything that way, too. <laughs> yeah, Roger, we're hoping you could save up. We're giving you advance notice to start saving for, for ABLE next July. <laughs> Okay, thanks all. Um, Keith, if you don't mind just keeping the chat open for a few more minutes, um, that would be great. Otherwise, hope everyone has a good rest of the day or night, depending on where you are. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks for your contributions. Bye.